and gentlemen, it is such a wonderful pleasure to have you all here today. Uh, this has been a, a project of love for myself and for my co-convener, Theo Dunkeldrun, and for so many other people in this room uh, who have helped us come uh, to this very important day. Uh, and, and we're very, very pleased that you're all here with us. Now, before we get going, a few uh, absolute banalities. Uh, we live in a time of trouble and strife, uh, and uh, in particular of uh, international viral infection. Uh, therefore, today we shall be taking certain steps to mitigate uh, potential issues as best we can uh, under the circumstances. In the entryway, you may have seen that there is some anti-bacterial uh, sanitizing hand gel. Uh, do please free, feel free to avail yourself of its use. Uh, there are also bathrooms for uh, 20 seconds of uh, concerted hand washing all around. Um, this theoretically is a handshake free conference. Um, so do feel free to bow to one another, to rub elbows, uh, uh, to, to, to whatever feels right. And, uh, and do please not feel offended uh, if somebody uh, does not, uh, as it were, reach out the hand for a shake or pour faire les bises. Uh, because it's just the, the times in which uh, we live. Um, there will be a reception uh, that was previously unscheduled that will follow tonight's keynote address uh, by John Krebs in the Master's Lodge. Uh, we shall move en masse to the Master's Lodge um, at around 4.45 this afternoon. Uh, there will be a talk from Stephen Wordsworth, the director of CARA, and there will be a talk by John Krebs. Uh, about the Hans Krebs Trust and a number of other very important and interesting things. Uh, and then there will be a wine reception for everybody, uh, to which all are very warmly invited straight thereafter in the lodge. Now, um, as I said, planning this conference has been an absolute labor of love. Uh, this conference was born in many ways within this college uh, when the chaplain of this college invited myself uh, and Teo to help organize the first ever Holocaust commemoration ceremony in Trinity College. Uh, and so Teo and I began knocking our heads together uh, and began thinking more deeply about uh, the story of Trinity's role, of Cambridge's role uh, within the national and international effort uh, to help refugee and refugee scholars, artists, and families uh, find safety in Britain and then throughout the world uh, between 1933 and 1945, uh, and began to think in much broader terms about the vast impact that this movement, this act of sanctuary, had upon the worlds of scholarship uh, thereafter. Uh, and I, I will just add that since we launched this project, um, it has been uh, a project that really has involved the work of a village. Uh, and now you know, we are all here today as part of that growing village of participants in this project and story. Uh, today, we will be discussing many names, many people, many stories. But there are countless stories uh, that we will not be discussing. Um, many of them um, we already have in our minds as stories that we're telling elsewhere or that we're thinking about elsewhere. Some of them we won't even yet know about, and you will know about. And so I do please urge you, as we go, if a name or a story or an archive occurs to your minds, people who have taken such an interest in the subject, note it down, make a list, and share it with us. Uh, there are so many stories um, uh, to share within this, within this broader story. And I'll now hand over to Dr. Dunkelgrun. Thank you so much, Aaron. So if, if the Trinity College Holocaust Memorial event was one of the places where this idea was born, another was a crash, where I've been a research fellow for the past seven years and where, under the directorship of Professor Simon Goldhill, uh, the center became the place for refugee scholars in our own time. So I remember that one year, when I least expected, suddenly the desk to my left was vacated, and there was a political theorist from Benghazi University in Libya. The following year, the desk across from mine uh, welcomed an economist from Aleppo, Syria. And these were people who uh, had lost everything, and who were given refuge thanks to CARA, the Council for At-Risk Academics, uh, in Cambridge. Um, and uh, their stories um, touched me profoundly and gave was there a renewed sense to what a university can be, to this ideal of uh, a free pursuit of learning, 
and the way in which, in a sense, when one academic is threatened anywhere, there's a real sense in which all academics are threatened everywhere. And Cambridge really rose up to the challenge, um, and I became very interested in, in this organization with which I was uh, shamefully unfamiliar. And so the Trinity event uh, offered a moment to kind of reflect on the way in which CARA, this current, uh, this incredibly important uh, NGO um, in Britain, was born in the 1930s, and we'll hear more about that this evening. Um, but uh, it was really remarkable to discover how closely that organization was connected with Cambridge. We'll speak a bit more of that, uh, about that this evening, but it was founded in 1933 when um, William Beveridge of the London School of Economics had been in Vienna, um, happened to be in Vienna in uh, a few weeks after the Nazis came to power, and someone at a cafe uh, seated next to him was reading out from the newspaper the names of uh, academics who had lost uh, their jobs. And he went back to England and visited his friend, uh, G.M. Trevelyan, the historian and uh, later master, wartime master of Trinity College. And the idea arose to found what would become the Academic Assistance Council, um, uh, of which uh, after uh, a renaming to the Society for the Protection of Science and Learning uh, is now CARA, the Council for At-Risk Academics. Then there was one more place, one more place where this, where this, the, our idea and, and, and inspiration for this conference was uh, formulated conceptually, and that is in the comparative seminar for the, the, the seminar for comparative social and cultural history, which I convened together with uh, Mary Lavin and Lisbeth Kovens and Peter Burke in 2015, um, and it was in that year that. Uh, Professor Burke was rewriting his Menachem Stern lectures into uh, what would become his Exiles and Expatriates in the History of Knowledge. Really a magnificent, uh, ambitious history ranging from 1500 to 2000, um, uh, in which uh, Professor Burke doesn't only tell the story of countless intellectuals and scholars who were driven into exile voluntarily, involuntarily, and, and, and left their home countries for a variety of reasons, but precisely the impact of that experience on their own scholarship. And as Aaron and I um, began to learn about uh, academics who had found refuge in Cambridge, it turned out that one after the other had shaped their discipline in profound ways. Um, just to mention only a few, of course, the well-known case of Hirsch Lauterpacht, who came here in the 1930s as a professor of international law and coined the term crimes against humanity to become um, prosecutor at Nuremberg. Um, Leo Radzinovitz, who founded the first institute of criminology in the English-speaking world. Eva Reichmann, who was a historian at the LSE, which, was, which spent the war in Cambridge as well, and where she wrote her LSE PhD uh, here in Cambridge, the very first study uh, or, or social history of the rise of anti-Semitism in interwar Germany. These are not just scholars who happen to be here as refugees and happen to work on these topics. Their work was deeply bound up um, with their own time in ways that Hannah Arendt already um, sketched in her Men in Dark Times. So as we found in the case of Eva Reichmann and many others, there were also greatly gifted women in dark times in Cambridge. And, um, <coughs> and so it was really Peter Burke's book, which helped us conceptualize what this, what, what this topic might be and how a proper reconstruction of the history of academic exile and its impact on the disciplines across the social sciences, the natural sciences, and the humanities um, would look like. Um, finally, um, we, uh, we thought, you know, once we applied for conference funding to Crash um, and then to Trinity, we thought that we would need to send out a call for papers around the world to all the corners of the World Wide Web. Within two weeks, we had a day and a half of packed, packed papers just by speaking. Everyone seemed to have a story. Um, everyone we spoke to about this knew someone who knew someone, either their, their doctoral supervisors, um, their neighbors, uh, their friends, um, their foster siblings. Um, we were particularly touched to speak with um, many of the children of these academic uh, refugees who grew up in Cambridge or its environs were happy that Monica Frisch is here. Uh, we spoke with 
uh, Vivian Perus and Robin Perus will be speaking to us tomorrow. Um, we've spoken with Jennifer Glynn, who's been incredibly generous with her own memories. Um, and we received a very touching letter from um, Basil Poston, um, the son of Munya Poston. Um, it would be wrong of me not to um, end with a note of thanks um, to the organizations who've made this day possible. A crash, first of all, uh, and the enthusi abiding enthusiasm of Jan and Mr. Graham. Um, Trinity College, in particular, Nicholas Bell, uh, not only speaker today, but really who's been a supporter of this project from the very beginning, uh, and Miri Rubin from the, society, from the Jewish Historical Society of England. Um, and so, yeah, so we, we've thought about this deeply um, and conceptually. We know also that we'll be learning a great deal over the course of the next two days. Um, we, we, we we're also very um, strongly minded that it's not be a story merely of heroism, but that the heroism takes its contours and its perspectives because of the surrounding darkness. For all the scholars who found refuge in Cambridge, there are many, many more who never made it out. Um, the stories that we'll be hearing are oftentimes ones of refuge that was made possible by dedicated individuals, not large uh, government plans. It is the, the, a few individuals can make the difference um, in the lives of thousands, and one story after another will bear this out. Finally, let me say that part of what makes this story so urgent to us personally, um, and to many of you here, I imagine, is that this is an unfinished story. This is a story that takes place, that we are telling in a world in which many academics, even in Europe, as, as close as Hungary, have faced persecution, have faced entire institutions being sent into exile. We live in a time of rising authoritarianism, um, and this threatens not only our free societies, but also the practice of science and scholarship. And we do believe that Cambridge can rise to the occasion, precisely because we have such a strong legacy of academic refuge. Now, um, I want to introduce our first chair. Okay. Um, I'm very glad to invite the chair of our first panel to introduce our speakers, um, but I will introduce her. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, my friend and colleague, Marianne Middlecoat, uh, completed her PhD here in, uh, on art and foreign cultural policy in Weimar, Germany, 1917 to 1933, uh, in history at Peterhaus, uh, where her doctoral research was funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, the Deutsche Akademische Austauschdienst, and the Prince Bernhard Kulturfonds. Um, in 2015, uh, she was a visiting uh, doctoral fellow at the University of Konstanz, um, uh, teaching the MA course Art and Politics in Europe in the 20th Century. Marianne has previously worked as a researcher at the Commission for Looted Art in Europe in London and contributed to the development of the Looted Art 1939-1961 database for the National Archives in Kew Gardens. Prior to becoming a teaching associate in the Department of History of Art here in Cambridge, uh, Dr. Middlecope was a junior research fellow in modern history at Wolfson, uh, working on the project A Thing of Fragile Beauty, Porcelain, War, and Plunder in the Third Reich, 1939 to 49. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Marianne Middlecope.